Well, good evening, and welcome to the worship of God. John Flavel, or Flavel, depending on how you want to pronounce it, he's our preparation for worship this morning. It's a Puritan, thought a fair bit about providence. I think he's the one with a lovely, lovely quote that God's providence is like Hebrew, meaning you, know, you read it backward. You think about your own life. That's how it works. God's providence, you read it backward. Think about, well, okay, if you're married, how did you meet your spouse? Think about how you got this job. Think about how did God take you through this cancer? You, you, read, it, you read it backward. And I realize that you are facing me, so I'm going forward, apparently. So we'll flip it around. Here's Flavel talking about providence again. Providence is wiser than you. And you may be confident it has suited all things better to your eternal good than you would do if you had been left your own option. We're going to see providence tonight with David. And if you think about David's life and you think about your own, my guess is you can see why the psalmist said, God, remember David and all his troubles because he's got a lot more than probably any of us. And you were spending so much time on his life because your own life has troubles, but you only see God's providence backwards. And Flavel is saying, if you could see it forward, you would say, I'm going to let him choose whatever is best for me because he always seems to know best. Our call to worship along those lines, Psalm 28, the Lord is the strength of his people, a fortress of salvation for his anointed one. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. Let's go to our God in prayer, asking that we would continue trusting that he's shepherding us. Father, you are the, the shepherd of your people, and we're your people. Father, as we gather in your sanctuary, we ask that we'd have that sense. And Father, the sense that you would get, and of course you know all, is that we're becoming just a little more submissive to your leadership this evening. And that would make us just a little bit happier. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together to sing Christian Hearts, Love United. Think about the, the words as we're singing them. This is why we gather. Let's stand to sing Christian Hearts and Love United. this God who's 
light your life reflects, he welcomes you with these words. And may grace be yours. May God's mercy be yours. May his peace rest on and in you. These all come from God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, and as God has welcomed us, let's welcome one another. Good evening, Russia. going to be saying together the Nicene Creed. Um, after we do the Nicene Creed, we're going to be singing together the strife is o'er, the battle done, in part because the Nicene Creed spends to- so much time focusing on, on Jesus. So let's read together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures. He is sent into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to life in the world to come. Amen. It's going to be singing together the five verses of the strife is or.
Please be seated. I ask the children, please come forward for children and worship. Let's see. We got some that are already out there. Oh, and here comes Harper and Lennon. Lennon in the lead. There we go. So tonight, let's do, we'll do open them, shut them, all right? So you watch me, and then we'll do it together. So it goes, open them, shut them, open them, shut them, give a little clap. Open them, shut them, open them, shut them, fold them in your lap. We don't really have a lap, but we're going to pretend. Ready? Open them, shut them, open them, shut them, give a little clap. Open them, shut them, open them, shut them, fold them in your lap. Let's pray. And Father, we thank you for these children. We ask that you'd bless them as they go forth and they worship you. We ask that you'd be with their leader. And we thank you for those who help with this ministry and for those who learn to worship you through this ministry. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may go in peace. I always knew when my mom was talking to a little kid on the phone because she did her mommy voice, and I do the exact same, same thing, where it's like, and how are you? Um, congregational prayer. Let's go together. Do we have any requests, petitions, praises for this week ahead, week behind? Seth, for Diane, indeed, she has appreciated all the different visits of people popping over to, to see her, and she certainly, I'm sure, appreciates us praying for her. Vonda. Oh, is that Lachman? Lotman. Lotman. Wow. So the Lotman family is they bury their son Mike. How how old was Mike? Wow. I'll certainly pray for them. Nathan. Indeed. I would imagine, thankful for good test results and also thankful for not having a doctor's appointment the first week, said in September, right? Not a week to schedule like an eye exam or something like that for anybody. Yeah, that's encouraging. Indeed, your friend Nancy's got COVID and the one's struggling with it. Yeah. It's always interesting. Those things continue to linger on, even though they're not as much in the public eye, but they still are affecting folks. Jay. Yeah, the people in the earthquake in Turkey. Indeed. Anybody else? How is Craig's mom doing? It's very touch and go. Gotcha. We'll certainly pray for her. 
I'm sure Craig too, because I'm sure it's hard to be that far away from your mom when all that's going on. Oh, really? Gotcha. Yeah, kind of heartache on heartache there then. All right. Thank you, Jane. All right, let's go together to our God in prayer. Father, we thank and we do praise you that you are in, in charge, as we thought about this morning, that you care for us, and that you like it when we come to you with that understanding. Father, we pray for, for Diane Niemeyer as she's recovering. We ask that she would indeed be, be praying your will be done, that she would be resting in that. And that's hard when you're in the, the hospital for as long as she has been in and, and will still be there. Father, we think about that as well with uh, the new endorps. We rejoice with, with Eliza's scan results. And Father, also rejoice with them that they, they don't have a, a doctor's visit this week. It's easy for us to be thinking about uh, the big things when we think about a situation like that. But Father, the, the regular grind of week in and week out doctor's visits, Father, those are things we don't often think about, but they do take their, their toll. So we rejoice with them and the, the big things and also the relief from the, the weekly grind. Father, as we think about very big things, we think about the, the Lotman family with the loss of Mike. Think about them burying their son. And Father, not the, not the way anybody plans on it going. We ask that, Father, you would give them a very clear understanding of your care and your presence. Father, we ask that your word would be of comfort to them and your people as well. Father, we think about your people being comfort as we think about the earthquake in Turkey. We ask that your church there, Father, would be doing very good deeds, would be caring for, for all, Father, that those in need would be cared for. Father, we... Don't know why it is that you send natural disasters, this place, that place. We don't exactly know uh, so many different aspects of your providence. But Father, we do trust that you are in charge. And we do trust that you're able to care for, for these people. Father, we pray that as well as we think about Nancy with COVID. And Father, we think about others with it as well. Father, we think about those who suffer long-term effects from that. And Father, we think about those who have any number of other conditions that make it harder to, to have a disease like that. Father, we ask that you would heal Nancy and heal others. And Father, we pray for, for Ruth, for, for Craig's mom. Father, we think about the, the difficult situation she's in and has been in for, for a while now. Father, we think about her kids being all over the, the place geographically. And Father, I would imagine that it's a not just a very stressful time, although it is that, but Father, also a very, very sorrowful and fearful and in many ways lonely time for, for each of them. But Father, you know, and though we feel alone, we are, are never alone, but it does feel that way sometimes. And Father, we don't know exactly what it is that you have planned for Ruth, but you do. And so we ask that you would be caring for her. Father, we ask this all in the, the name of your Son. Amen. In preparation for hearing God's word, let's stand together to sing two verses of How Firm a Foundation.
please be seated. We've got not one, but two chapters. First Samuel 29, First Samuel 30. The way that I tend to think preaching ought to be done is expositorily. There's only a few exclusions I do to that, and what that means is you take what's called the pericope. Your pericope is kind of your unit of, of understanding, kind of hitting one big idea. So if you think, man, he only hits one big idea, well, you got me, you got me figured out. Not that hard to figure out. And here, there's really only one big idea that runs through two chapters. That's why we do two chapters. It's also why we can kind of do th three or four verses, so two last week in the morning. 1 Samuel 29 and 30. The Philistines gathered all their forces at Aphek, and Israel camped by the spring of, in Jezreel. As the Philistine rulers marched with their units of hundreds and thousands, David and his men were marching at the rear of Achish, rear with Achish, rather. The commanders of the Philistines asked, what about these Hebrews? Achish replied, is this not David, who is an officer of Saul, king of Israel? He's already been with me for over a year, and from the day he left Saul until now, I've found no fault with him. But the Philistine commanders were angry with him and said, send the man back. He may return to his own place that you assigned him. He must not go out with us into battle or he'll turn against us during the fighting. How better could he regain his master's favor than by taking the heads of our own men? Isn't this David they sang about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands, David his tens of thousands. So Achish called David and said to him, As surely as the Lord lives, you've been reliable, and I would be pleased to have you serve with me in the army. From the day you came to me until now, I have found no fault in you. But the rulers don't approve of you. Turn back, go in peace, and do nothing to displease the Philistine rulers. But what have I done? Asks David. He's going for the Academy Award here. What have you found against your servant from the day I came to you until now? Why can't I go and fight against the enemies of my lord the king? Achish answered, I know that you've been as pleasing in my eyes as an angel of God. Nevertheless, the Philistine commanders have said he must not go up with us into battle. So now get up early along with your master's servants who have come with you and leave in the morning as soon as it's light. So David and his men got up in the morning to go back to the land of the Philistines, and the Philistines went up to Jezreel. Take a look back, chapter 28. That's the end of verse 20, chapter 29. Look back at 28, final verse. Then she sent it before Saul and his men, and they ate. That same night they got up and left. We'll think about that. Saul leaving at night, David leaving in the morning. David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziklag. They attacked Ziklag and burned it and had taken captive the women and all who were in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men came to Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and their sons and their daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives had been captured, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David was greatly distressed because the men were, taking, were talking about stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and his daughters, but David found strength in the Lord his God. Then David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. Ahimelech brought it to him, and David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. David and the 600 men with him came to the Besor Ravine, where some stayed behind, for 200 men were too exhausted to cross the ravine. But David and 400 men continued the pursuit. They found an Egyptian in a field and brought him to David. They gave him water to drink and food to eat, part of a cake of fresh pig, Breast pigs? We're going to go with 
pressed figs? Do you want, what, what do you think, do you want a pressed pigs or pe- pressed figs, which one? We're going with the pressed figs. And two cakes of raisins. He ate and was revived, for he had not eaten any food or drunk any water for three days and three nights. And David asked him, to whom do you belong and where do you come from? He said, I'm an Egyptian, the slave of an Amalekite. My master abandoned me when I became ill three days ago. We raided the Negev of the Carathites and the territory belonging to Judah and the Negev of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag. David asked him, can you lead me down to this raiding party? He answered, swear to me before God that you will not kill me or hand me over to my master, and I will take you down to them. He led David down, and there they were, scattered all over the countryside, eating, drinking, and reveling because of the great amount of plunder they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from Judah. David fought them from dusk until the evening of the next day. And none of them got away except 400 young men who rode off on camels and fled. David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Nothing was missing, young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else they had taken. David brought back everything. He took all the flocks and herds, and his men drove them ahead of the other livestock, saying, This is David's plunder. Then David came to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow him and who were left behind at the Besor Ravine. They came out to meet David and the people with him. As David and his men approached, he greeted them. But all the evil men and troublemakers among David's followers said, Because they did not go with us, we will not share with them the plunder we recovered. However, each man may go and take his wife and children, he can go. David said, No, no, brothers. You must not do that. With what the Lord has given us, he protected us, and he handed over to us the forces that came against us. Who will listen to what you say? The share of the man who stayed with the supplies is to be the same as the man who went down to the battle. All will share alike. David made this a statute and an ordinance for Israel from that day until this. When David arrived in Ziklag, he sent some of the plunder to the elders of Judah, who were his friends, saying, Here is a present for you from the plunder of the Lord's enemies. He sent it to those who were in Bethel, Ramoth, Negev, and Jatir, to those who were in Aror, Sifmoth, Eshtemoa, and Rakal, to those who were in the towns of the Jeremalites, Jeremalite, Jer- Jeremalites, and to the Kenites, to those who were in Hormah, Borashan, Atak, and Hebron, and to those who were in all the other places where David and his men had roamed. I encourage you to keep God's word open before you. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, as we have opened your word, probably not a a word that we've spent much time thinking about in our our lives. There's passages that we we camp on. There's passages that we, we know by heart. This is one that I would imagine for a lot of us we haven't really given too much thought thought to, but we do thank you that as we work our way through your word, we read things we know and we also read things we don't want to be well-rounded Christians. Think about your son who said that not a jot or a tittle will pass away from, from your word until it comes to pass. So, Father, we ask that as we open this, we would see a bit of your mind and begin to think a little bit more like you, meaning we might be a little bit more like your son. That would be good for us. That would be a benefit to the community around us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you know the problems you've got. Now, you don't need anybody to tell you what your problems are. You know you you spend hours thinking about why is it that your daughter seems to be wandering away from the Lord. You spend a fair bit of time thinking about your roommate's situation. You spend a fair bit of time thinking about, well, what about your your business partner and what what if he splits off? You don't need anybody to tell you the problems that you got. You know those problems. You don't know the problems you don't have. God does. So God knows the problems that you got, and he knows the problems you don't have as in yet. 
the problems that you'll have a year from now, problems you'll have a week from now. God knows those. And he's able to deal with both. God's able to deal with the problems that you know, the ones that continue to kind of grind in your brain that you can't seem to kind of click into gear so they can finally get moving somewhere. He knows those. Knows them just as well as you do. Sees them differently, but he knows them. And he also knows the problems that you don't know. And he's trustworthy with both. One of the the reasons... The Bible includes so many narratives. Narratives are just these long stories. It includes these long stories about people. It is to say, let's just keep watching somebody over a long period of time, because your life is going to be a long period of time. And you know that some days just seem like they stretch on forever, and if there's problems, they seem like they go forever. And how do you see God at work in the stuff of life? Uh, that's kind of what narratives are about. In the stuff of David's life tonight, what we see is that God, he's trustworthy with the problems you know and with the problems you don't know. And you got both. In the lives of his chosen ones, God is trustworthy in the midst of their problems, both the ones we know about and the ones we don't. We're going to start with the ones David knows about. And that's out of the frying pan, our first point. Last week we, we thought about Saul's problems. Now we go back to David's problems, what the author of 1 Samuel is doing. He's saying, let me tell you about David, then let me tell you about Saul. Let me tell you about David, let me tell you about Saul. And now let me tell you about David and how his horrible problems, things can't seem to get worse for David. If he fights the Israelites, he's the the coming king of the Israelites who's going to deal with that for the rest of his life. That's going to be a political nightmare for him forever. Oh, remember when he slaughtered some of us? Or he's going to have to fight the Philistines in the middle of them. That's his problem. That's pretty bad. Okay, well, let me tell you about Saul's problem. He's totally cut off from God, and God won't listen to him anymore. It can get worse. That's where he is with the witch of Endor. Now we go back to David's problems. Reminder here is we want to make sure we're somebody who's hearing and who's trusting. That's where the focus is on now. It's back on David. The author takes us just a little bit back in time, back before Saul went to Endor. At that point, the Philistine army had made it to Shunem. Now they only make it to Aphek, which is about 40 miles still to go. So David and his men, they're marching with the Philistine army on the way to fight Saul. And Achish, king of Gath, had drafted the Israelite, these Israelite men, David and his men, into the army because he thinks that they're as anti-Israel as any Philistine. Achish thinks that they've been raiding Israelite towns. And so word spreads in the Philistine ranks that there's Israelites marching with them to fight Israel. And this had happened before. It's back, I think, chapter 14. Israelites disguised as Philistines were marching with the Philistines and at some point in the battle they reveal who they are in the sense of they start killing Philistines. And so you get, you get these Philistine commanders saying, hey, remember what happened? Do we want that again? This is exactly what the Nazis did in the Battle of the Bulge. You get Nazis dressing up like American soldiers. You get Patton. I cleaned up the language because Patton's language is horribly bad generally. But he he tells Eisenhower, Nazis, speaking perfect English, cutting wires, turning road signs, spooking whole divisions, and shoving a bulge into our defenses. That's what the Philistine commanders think David and his men are going to do. And they go to Achish and say, what are you, nuts? You just, you want these guys to come with us? Do you think this is going to be a really helpful move? And Achish, he's he's defending David. He's been with me a year. He's been doing a great job. And the Philistine commanders basically say to to Achish, look, you can be naive on your own time. You get them out of here. 
And the irony on irony is you get Achish, this Philistine king, super apologetic to David, who's later going to slaughter the Philistines. I, 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 hope you don't, I hope you're not offended. I, I don't hope you're not mad at, at me for this. But you can't, you can't fight with us. And he even swears by the Lord, the, the Yahweh, as an act of courtesy. He says, as surely as the Lord lives, as surely as your God lives, you've been reliable. I'd be pleased to give you and have you serve with me in the army. So Achish, he doesn't see what's super obvious to you, which is David is not anti-Israel. He doesn't see what's super obvious to his commanders, which is David is somebody to watch out for. Kings have a way of misjudging David. Saul considered David his mortal enemy, yet he was, in fact, his most loyal subject. We've seen that for a while. Now, Achish considers David his most trusted subject, but he was, in fact, his most dangerous enemy. As Bergen put it, I'm misjudging the Lord's anointed. That, that's a perennial human problem. Right? It's not just Saul, it's not just Achish, it's Pilate. Misjudging the Lord's anointed. It's the Pharisees misjudging the Lord's anointed. That's the Gospels. People regularly misjudging the Lord's anointed. You are in exactly the same situation in many ways as Achish. Are you going to get the Lord's anointed right? For Achish, it all hangs on that here. He doesn't get David right. For you, it hangs on, okay, do I get Jesus right? That, that really is the question. And so Achish assumes that David's going to be insulted. He tries to make it right. And David, of course, can't say all these things he's thinking to Achish, so he, he continues to play the part. He says, well, what, what have I done? Like, David is super relieved inside because this is a predicament that he's been totally freaking out over. How, how am I going to get out of this? I've got to go fight my own people. But he's got to play the part, so it's a sense of, well, what, are, what did I do? I'm trying my best. Why can't I go fight? Why can't I go kill these people? Why can't I help you? He says that because he knows he can't go. Or he sees the human side of it, but you see the divine side. You read through, and you can see that this is all of the Lord. You can see that even when Achish told David, you're going to be with me there, you're going to be my bodyguard there, and we're going to fight the Israelites, you now know that God had that in mind then. And the trick for you, the trick for me is to say, well, God's got these things in mind when you first see the problems. God's already got the resolution in mind when you first realize there's a problem. And in fact, he had the resolution in mind before you even knew something was wrong. He's not freaked out about it. This is how Jesus lives. Jesus lives as if his father has resolutions for whatever problem he's facing, and also that there's resolutions for problems that would come in the future. This is why, like this morning, he just says, well, get to know my father. This is why on your fridge, in the magnet, the first thing is just knowing God. That, that's the main thing. You get that one right, everything else falls into place. You get that one wrong, it's going to show up in very nasty things. And we all get it wrong in certain ways, which is why we got so many different problems, by and large. And so David's saved from his problems. It's a, it's a new day from David. As we saw at the end of the chapter, it says, David and his men got up early in the morning and to go back to the land of the Philistines. And I pointed out, as we read at the last, of the last chapter, it's Saul getting up in the middle of the night. He's going off to fight the Philistines. Dale Ralph, Ralph Davis notices this at the, at the end of the chapter to say, look, look at Saul going out in the pitch darkness. Look at David going out for him. It's a new day. Now, the call is to listen. The call is to trust. That's what you see Saul struggling mightily to do and falling in with, with that witch. That's what you see David doing listening and trusting. That, that's, that's what a brand new day is. That's how you get those. Mercy's new every morning. So the Lord delivers David from his trouble. He pulls him out of the frying pan and now it's into the fire. And that's our second point. Into the fire. 
David and his men go back to, to Ziklag, and they're totally relieved. All right, that, that this is just a sense of, man, we, we, by the skin of our teeth, we got out of that one. And they realize they got way more trouble at home. The Amalekites, who they had raided already, we read that, studied that a few weeks ago, the raids on the Amalekites. Amalekites noticed that, well, you know what, all David and his men took off. So what's good for the goose is good for the gander, and now we're going to raid their hometown. We're going to take all their stuff. We're going to take their families. They took everyone and everything. They had attacked Ziklag and burned it, the text said. They had taken captive the women and all who were in it, both young and old. Now, they probably took the women and the children, likely to sell as slaves or to, to use as bargaining chips, because those are exceedingly valuable bargaining chips if you want something, people's families. These are nasty people they're dealing with here. But David and his men, they go from relief to misery in a matter of seconds. Now, maybe you've had situations like that. You're totally relieved by some disaster you just narrowly averted, and then obviously it's out of the frying pan, it's into the fire. If you have a sense of, I thought life was as bad as it could get yesterday, <laughs> no, it's, it's a lot worse now. My problem I had before doesn't matter at all, but this new one, I would trade it for the old one in a second. That's where David is now. David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. That's what we read. Men cry. All right, these men cried until they were spent. They had no more emotion left to cry. We've got a lot of different strange views in our culture about gender. I mean, not just different thinking about struggles with men wanting to be women and women wanting to be men. There's also struggles about macho culture of, well, men, men don't cry. Here's what real men are like. Here's what real women are like. Who knows how, since we're split into men and women, who knows how many of us have had difficulties and frustrations in life because this is what a man is and do I add up to this? This is what a woman is and do I add up to this? Well, what the text says here is, well, one thing men do is they, they, they cry when there's reason to cry. There's nothing wrong with that. You got emotions. God made you with emotions. You got them. He's kind of happy to make you with them. He thinks it's good that you got them. But they shouldn't rule you. That's what we see. Because these men, the, David's men, their sorrow and their frustration turns into rage and they're, they're planning now to kill David. Because who is it that got us into this mess? And David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in his spirit because of his sons and daughters, but David found strength in the Lord his God. So David's men deal with their anguish by turning on David. David deals with his double anguish, his wife, his kids, and now the fact that his people are going to try to kill him by turning to the Lord. Now you might wonder, well, what did David say? Well, we don't know what David said, but you've got psalm after psalm after psalm after psalm of David in horrible trouble telling you exactly what it's like. That's why the psalms are there. Are you in trouble? Well, he knows what it's like. Do you feel like everybody, everybody doesn't like you and nobody wants to be by you? There's like seven psalms you could just easily rattle and say, yeah, David's there, and he writes what it's like. Do you feel like the best days of your life are long since over? Well, David's got psalms about that. Feel like you'd be better off just kind of going to glory right now, not having to go through life anymore? Well, there's psalms about that. Look on me and answer, Lord my God, give light to my eyes or I'll sleep in death. That's David in Psalm 13. Answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me. Hear me. Psalm 4. You want strength in the Lord? You go to the Psalms. Right, thinking about God's, God's Word, what we tend to, to do is you really got two choices with it. And I got two choices with it. You can use it or you, or you can neglect using it. You can use it or you can neglect it. Simply knowing facts about it isn't really going to do much. You either use it or you don't use it. It's like a tool, like a lamp. And so David turns to the Lord. And it's possible that David turns to the Lord the same day that Saul's turning to the necromancer. 
We're, we're all making choices. We're all turning somewhere. David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, he answered. You'll certainly overtake them. And you'll certainly succeed. That language of certainly overtake, and it says certainly succeed in the Hebrew. It's just translated as succeed. This is the, the most, most emphatic form that Hebrew can say. Kind of like when you're nine or ten years old, pinky swear, that's the most emphatic way you could say something. The Hebrew is basically saying, okay, God's saying, I pinky swear, you're going to overtake them. You're going to succeed. Well, there's no maybes when it comes to the Lord's will. If he says what he, if it's gonna, he's going to make it go the way he wants. He's in charge of the whole shooting match. That's true in your life and in my life. And you see the Lord's in complete control by the fact that mid-pursuit, David and his men ha just happened to find an Egyptian. That's what you're supposed to feel as you read through this text. Okay, the, the, they're, they're going, how are they going to find? I mean, well, put yourself in these men's shoes. I don't know, say that you're five people to the right of David, and you're running, or you on your camels, whatever, however, they're, they're chasing them down, and you're thinking, what are you thinking? If you got your kids, how in the world am I going to find them? I don't know which way they went. We're just taking off in a direction, just hoping for the best. So, and as the text says, well, they, they've come across an Egyptian. Well, that, then it just happened to be the case. David could not have saved his family without the providence of God here. And you are just as helpless without the providence of God. I'm just as helpless without the providence of God. If you find yourself in situations that seem hopeless, that might often be because you've really got eyes to see the situation. Except for God. And so David, he, he treats this Egyptian slave well. Even though he was part of the raiding party that burned down his, his town that he had built up. And he treats him well because he's the king. Right? He, he's a law of Moses follower. The law of Moses. A, a, a lady, brilliant lady. I don't agree with her on a number of things. Marilyn Robinson. Exceedingly bright. Um, but she spends a lot of times in, in academic circles. I mean, there's a number of things that I think she probably drank the, the Kool-Aid of, of some of those things. But she is somebody who's in a very secular environment who's telling people over and over again, you know, the law of Moses is probably the most generous thing you're going to find about treating people who are downtrodden. Okay, so you want to tell me about Marx? You want to tell me about all that stuff? Let's go back to Moses. He actually knows how to take care of people that have problems. And that's why David's treating this Egyptian well. Because he knows the law of Moses. He knows, do not mistreat or oppress a foreigner, for you were foreigners in Egypt. So David has a sense, well, I should take care of people who are here from other countries, even though that they've got these problems. This is what David's thinking about here. You want to know what, what keeping the law looks like? That, that's what it looks like. And that's what it looks like with Jesus. That's what Jesus is. He is the one who keeps his own law. If you think Jesus would be a wonderful leader, a wonderful ruler, that's because he's got a really good law, and he keeps it. That, that's what he does. That's why you want him running your life, and somebody is running your life. The worst thing that could happen to any of us would be ourselves running our lives because we're fickle, and we're foolish, and we don't know. But Jesus does. And so the Egyptian leads David and his men to the Amalekites, and they're in the middle of a rager. Like these people are just blitzed. They're celebrating. Now, if people are that drunk, they're pretty easy to fight. That's some of what's going on here. There's debate about whether they fight from, our, our text talks about them fighting pretty much a day and a half. Other texts talk about them fighting to dusk, dawn to dusk. It doesn't really matter. Because the point is, and you're supposed to see how huge of a victory it is, because it says only 400 young men got away. Now, I'm going to need some help here. Somebody tell me how many men does David have with him at this point, if you've got your Bibles open. And we've seen this number, Jonathan. 400. You're supposed to see the extent of this victory to say only 400 got 
And it's supposed to say, well, all David ever had was 400. Just utterly slaughtering them. That, that's the exceeding victory. Well, only 400 got away. Yeah, well, we only had 400. Who knows how many they must have killed. So you're supposed to see this was a tragedy that turned into a stunning victory. And now you see the providence in all of it because the Lord had made it so David and his men didn't have to fight their fellow Israelites. And the Lord had sent David and his men home in time enough to save their kids and their wives. That's totally salvation. That's totally of the Lord. Salvation is of the Lord. It still is. That is in your situation. When you look back on your life, when it's all over, you will say, the Lord was the only thing that actually took care of me in the end. He did it through means, he did it through people, but it was the Lord doing it all. But now, we're, we're not told this story about the Amalekites simply for, for something to say. You're told the story specifically about these Amalekites because the Amalekites were seen throughout Scripture as these are perennial enemies of God's people. Perennial, perennially, like, always desiring to destroy them. Their behavior is manifest of what God told the serpent. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. They're determined to eliminate the Israelites. And God's determined to save the world through Israelite, the Israelite. That, that's the conflict here. And Saul wouldn't take care of them. Saul had an opportunity to decimate the Amalekites, would not take it. Wanted to be more understanding than God. And God's like, you, you don't understand. That's why you're trying to be more understanding than me. You don't understand what's going to go here. You don't understand how to stop this. David, this is a sign he will. So Saul handers the plunder of the, fool, of the Amalekites foolishly. You can read chapter 15 about that. David, David handles it wisely. That's why so much, there's so much focus on the plunder. You might be reading through saying, okay, why do I care about the plunder? Why do I care about the camels? Why do I care about all the different gold? Why do I care about all this stuff? Well, the, the reason that we're, we're to care about it is to say, what does David do with it? He divides it up equally. He divides it up between those who stayed back and those who went. And the text makes a point to say, okay, that's how the Israelite armies have done it since. What that's to teach you is to say, well, the reason David does it is because the law of Moses has a quality baked into it. Treating people equally baked into it. Treating people the same baked into it. And that's why David's doing it. But what it's trying to say is David gets this from God's word and that's how customs develop. Right? That's the most beautiful customs most likely that you enjoy developed out of some sort of obedience. Like think about Thanksgiving, giving thanks, the various traditions you have with that. That's just something baked into Scripture that people are like, well, it would be good for us to do that. And so we have a holiday about it. Those are the most beautiful customs you have. And there's different ones in our own church you can think about. Why do people do it? Why did, we hold, why did I hold hands with those kids, bless them, send them off to children and worship? Well, because Deuteronomy 6 <clears throat> talks about instructing children. Like, you just don't think of those things. It's not like, well, what would be good to do? God's Word says this is what would be good, so let's just do that. So David splits the, the plunder equally, and then he gives also some as gifts. He gives some to the elders of Judah. Here's a present for you from the plunder of the enemy, the, the plunder of the Lord's enemies. He sent some to towns all over Israel. He sent some to Levite towns. Three of these towns are towns where all the Levites live. Something as a tithe. David's saying, well, this, this was a gift from God. We're going to give some back to God. So this warrior who Achish thought was, was anti-Israel, now he's sending gifts all over Israel. And the message you're to read as you see this is he's sending towns gifts here in Israel and here in Israel and here in Israel, here in Israel, almost as if he's caring for the whole country, almost as if he's the king. And people in those days were by and large used to kings taking and taking and taking. I'm going to take a fair percentage of the produce you get from your crops. I'm going to take a fair percentage of your livestock. I'm going to take a fair percentage of your children. David's giving. He's a little like Jesus who lived and died as if it really was better to give than to receive. 
And you see that this kingship is in mind because the last town mentioned is Hebron. That's where David's going to be crowned king. This whole story, this whole series we're doing, all we're doing is waiting for the king. Right? When David becomes king, the series is done. Once he's the king of all of Israel, we'll do a couple chapters on the Civil War because he's not fully king. That's really the story of the whole Bible. It's just waiting for the king. That's all you're doing as a Christian. By and large, you're waiting for the king. That's because you're the king's chosen ones. And the only reason that you're a chosen one is the same reason David was. It's it's by grace. And you, like David, you're going to have problems along the way. Some you know about, some you don't know about yet, but you'll know about them. And sometimes it's going to seem like you were just in the frying pan and totally relieved that it got better, but now I'm actually in the fire, and I would be happy to be back in the frying pan. It's going to feel that way. But that's only because you know part of the picture. If you could see the whole picture of your life, if I could see the whole picture of my life, the way that we could read 1 Samuel 29 and 30, you would say, I'm in the exact same situation as David. Meaning, God's in charge. I can trust him with the problems I know about. I can trust him with the problems I don't know about. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we certainly know the problems that we got. The problems that we know about, we know about. Know them to death. Father, there's a lot of problems that we don't know about. That we will. You know about them. And Father, you know what to do. We ask that we would trust you from the youngest to the oldest. Father, we need your help with that. We thank you for your word showing us just a little bit about what that looks like in history so we can see how it will look like when our own lives are history. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Thinking about this long and meandering life, we're going to stand together to sing four verses of O Jesus, I Have Promised.
Let's go to our God in prayer, thinking about the offering this evening for Livingstone Prison Church. Father, we thank you for our deacons. We thank you for their work and our, their labors on our behalf. Father, a lot of it goes unnoticed and imagine at times feels unappreciated. Father, we ask that there would be joy in their service as they think about distributing funds. They think about caring for those who are in, in need. They think about, Father, relieving different suffering. Father, being near those in sorrow. Father, caring for those who are in affliction. And Father, we think tonight about giving money towards the, the Livingstone Prison Church. We thank you for them. And Father, we thank you for the work of Livingstone Prison Church. We ask that you'd bless them. We ask that, Father, that people might come to know you through that ministry. Father, we think about a system of justice in this nation. We thank you for all the ways it does work rightly. Think about, Father, as well, ways that it doesn't always work perfectly, and that can be said of any institution. We ask that Livingstone Prison Church would be able to help in both situations. We thank you for law and order we have in this land. We ask that that would be stronger. We thank you for those who serve in these areas. Father, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. After God's parting blessing, we're going to have just two verses of O for a thousand tongues to sing. I could just say for O two tongues to sing on that one. But now to him who's able to do far more than all you ask, anything you can imagine. To him who is able to work in us more abundantly, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in the Christ Jesus throughout all generations. Amen. <laughs>